Hello everyone. Welcome to the Nomads podcast. I'm your co-host Prachi and I'm your co-host Bhavya. Every rational human has once in their life thought about the implications of porn on oneself and the society. Gail Dines, anti-porn sociologist and professor at Wheelock College, claims in her work that due to the adverse implications of pornography to the society, it has made porn into a public health issue. And perhaps a way out is to enforce a complete ban on the porn industry. Our guest today, Andrew Baldassare, is a philosopher and his current work is in response to this idea. Andrew believes that it is important to acknowledge the pedagogical power of porn and harness this power for the betterment of society. It's an extremely interesting conversation where we talk about the current narrative surrounded with porn and I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. Andy Baldossary, welcome to the Nomads podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. So most, with most of our guests, we usually directly jump into the conversation. So we are all aware of this demographic, and we know uh, the young minds who watch porn. Yeah. I personally am part of the young dem- demographic. I started watching porn around the age of 12 or 13. And I completely understand your work and, and, and your ideas. But first, I would want you to speak about what, why were you interested in this? What got you started? Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so it's, it, you know, it's an interesting question because this is obviously a domain that a lot of people in, in academia don't, you know, don't broadcast. You know, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not like there's a huge amount of serious research being done into topics of porn outside of, you know, you, you have psych research and you have sociological research, but there's not a lot of philosophy going on there. Mm-hmm. And when, when you do find philosophy there, it's uh, mostly in, in a field of philosophy called aesthetics, right, which is, you know, concerned with philosophy of art and philosophy of media. And, you know, it asks questions like, is porn art? Can art be porn? Um, there's actually a professor uh, in my department who has written on exactly that question. Uh, the short answer is he thinks no, uh, mm-hmm. art can't be porn and vice versa. But anyways, uh, I just noticed uh, sort of an empty space in the literature. And I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people in academic philosophy are trying really hard to identify topics that aren't being talked about enough. Um, I think that's sort of how you, how you push the ball forward. Uh, and one thing I noticed was there is not a lot of discussion about uh, you know the philosophy of porn, right? The 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 ethical implications of mm-hmm. porn, and where there is conversation about it, there's a lot of uh, what I refer to as moral essentializing, right? Where people just say, "Oh, porn is," you know, and then insert whatever normative claim here, mm-hmm. right? You know, porn is good, porn is bad, mm-hmm. period, right? Okay. And then you and then you can give whatever reasons, and I. That just struck me as, as misconstrued, and I wanted to think about why that struck me as misconstrued, and that sort of led me down this rabbit hole, and then one thing led to another, and I was, uh, I was, I found myself emailing people from the industry, being right. like, why, what, like, why, why is this? And then uh, w- there was an interview, and then there was another interview, and then there was another interview. I was like, okay, this is, there's like a topic here. There's something to be written about this, and mm-hmm. that sort of got me. Got the ball rolling. So I, I understand the rationale behind it, mm-hmm. and I understand the the effects that it can have, and your work has sort of illustrated that. Uh, again, what 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 is this? What what affects on the society was was something that triggered you into the into the study of philosophy behind porn? Yeah, um, I again I. I, I'm concerned, you know, I'm primarily an ethicist, right? That's that's the domain I work in. And I was just, this was just a a, a space that wasn't being talked about. And mm-hmm. I and I thought it was time someone talked about it. And it really, it really began with just simple curiosity. I was just curious, right? I was curious, uh, you know, to just sort of lay the thesis out there. Mm-hmm. I 
was was curious as to whether or not porn couldn't just be co-opted for good. I mm -hmm. think there's an instinct that it's a bad thing, and usually any serious analysis of the question, is it good or bad, is mm -hmm. like couched in psych research, you know, what kind of psychological effect does it have, or sociological research. Um, a lot of my paper is structured as a, a reply to a professor at Wheelock College mm -hmm. named Gail Dines. She's a sociologist. Um, and she's looking at these sort of sociological scale effects of porn. And I just noticed everyone who was talking about was doing that moral essentializing. They were saying, porn is good, or porn is bad, right? Mm -hmm. More often, porn is bad, mm -hmm. right? And I, that just struck me as, as an overly simplified version of, of the state of affairs, right? That just seemed mistaken to me. And I thought, okay, if no one else is, no, no is going to seriously dig into the, mm -hmm. the, the ethical implications here, the normative implications here, mm -hmm. you know, why, why not me, right? Like, mm -hmm. I may as well. Um, and, and that's how that got started. Uh, and I came to this conclusion pretty quickly that, that what porn does is it changes the way people think. It has this incredible capacity, uh, you know, what I, what I refer to as like a pedagogical power, right? It has an incredible mm -hmm. capacity to inform. And unfortunately, you know, the state of the, of the media landscape, the state of porn today is such that it informs negatively. It, mm -hmm. by and large, sets bad standards that particularly young men internalize, and that has lifelong implications. Mm -hmm. uh, not just for those men, but for the women in their lives. Um, both, you know, both women with whom they have a sexual relationship and just women who they encounter, right? Like, mm -hmm. even, even in a, in a non-sexual domain, right? It informs the way you see members of the other sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't see any reason that porn has to be that way, mm -hmm. right? The pedagogical power that it has is there, right? It, it is there. Why can't we co-opt it, right? Can we use it for something better? Um, and I, th I think absolutely, right? It seems obvious to me that we, that we can. Hmm. Sorry, I think I've lost the thread of the original question <laughs> now. <laughs> no, I think yeah, that's, that's yeah. the idea. So your ideas assume that patriarchal norms are the cause of the bad reputation that the porn industry has. And I mean, I feel that the majority of people who consider that porn is bad also consider that porn comes under the patriarchal real, uh, realism that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So starting with, if you would like to, you know, describe to our audience what is patriarchal realism. How would you answer that? Do you think because of that, people turn a blind eye to it and don't come forward to make a change in the whole narrative? Yeah, so, well, to address the first, the first part of the question, um, like what is patriarchal realism? Uh, patriarchal realism is this phenomenon that we see all over the place, uh, especially in, in Western culture, um, but I mean, it, it's everywhere. It's this phenomenon where we see patterns of behavior that are, you know, patriarchal in nature. So a great example is uh, the sort of the tradition of women after getting married taking their husband's last name. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we see these things happen and we then use that as evidence to reinforce our belief that patriarchal practices are normal, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't do it consciously, mm -hmm. right? Um, the idea that if you see uh, a heterosexual couple, right, that have children, uh, the instinct is that is that uh, the man in the relationship has a job, right? Mm -hmm. Our language is structured in this way. You know, we say we use the phrase, "Oh, what does he do?" Mm -hmm. right? right? We mm -hmm. we almost always assume that either they both work or at least he works, mm -hmm. right? And nowadays it's increasingly normal to expect that uh, both, mm -hmm. both people in the couple work. Uh, I, I think that you know, just follows from certain economic realities mm -hmm. of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you were to find out that someone was a stay-at-home dad and had a wife who worked, um, y you, you know, not for, not for any reason, not for uh, being... Um, you know, not for any biases that you consciously hold or wish you that you held, but you would you would probably have a second thought about that. I mean, that's that's normal. We're conditioned from a very young age to think that men do certain things and that's normal. And then when we see those behaviors expressed because we've already decided that it's normal, we then use that as evidence to reinforce 
what we've already decided is normal. But mm -hmm. there's nothing normal about it. If you, you know, follow it back to, to first principles, it's just a convention we adopted. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about it that like follows from nature, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So that's patriarchal realism. Uh, I'm, I am so sorry. What was the second part of your question? So <laughs> the second part is that I feel that porn industry and the mainstream porn that you talked about, that f may somehow fall under this patriarchal no uh, realism that it's normal that porn is the way it is and that's why people turn a blind eye mm. towards the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, sex work is traditionally gendered, right? Um, you know, uh, like, do male strippers exist? Sure, like the Magic Mike films. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, I, I, you know, when someone says to you, um, like, imagine a stripper, right? You're like, you're imagining a woman. Um, if you think of, uh, like, escort services, like, you think of women, right? When you see uh, prostitute characters in media, right, they're always women, right? We have, you know, the long history of sex work, at least as it is discussed and thought about, is uh, a gendered history. Mm -hmm. And so when we see, uh, when we see what I describe as mainstream porn, which is, you know, typically, uh, you know, let's say misogynistic in nature, mm -hmm. we don't think there's anything unnormal, you know, abnormal about that, mm -hmm. right? We, we see that and, and that just is what we expect. And, and sure enough, you know, whether someone watches porn or doesn't watch porn, whether someone is uh, pro-porn or anti-porn, if you ask someone about porn, that is what they're thinking of, right? Almost certainly, right? Mm. People imagine porn in this uh, misogynistic kind of way, right? Denigrating towards women, um, all about, you know, male pleasure and, um, you know, when, and this is why, this is why if you, you know, um, like you know, like POV porn, which is increasingly popular, uh, is mm -hmm. almost exclusively shot from the male perspective, mm -hmm. right. right? Because the assumption is that what you're here for is the male perspective, mm -hmm. right? When, and it, when when that happens, right, the 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 male in the scene disappears, right? The man in the scene disappears, so that the the viewer can impose him his yeah. his own agency, yeah. right? And I you know on purpose that I use the word his because that is the implicit target mm -hmm. viewer, right? The target audience is, are, is typically men in, in these cases. So he can impose his own agency onto the, the male actor in the scene. And the woman in the scene disappears. She becomes an object, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, you know, her agency is not valued at all. And we just have decided that that's normal. And there are people who are consciously trying to fight back against that. People inside and outside of the, of the porn industry. And I, you know... I think it's extremely laudable the people, especially the people in the industry, mm -hmm. who are getting so much resistance. Uh, you know, they have to they have to deconstruct, mm -hmm. you know, decades and generations of of you know internalized misogyny, and also find a market for what they're doing, and also on top of all that, do the difficult work of just staying in business and keeping mm -hmm. the content they make economically viable while they're swimming up, you know, upstream, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. We 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 look at the mainstream porn landscape, and we've just decided that what we see is the way it is. Mm -hmm. mm. So maybe just talk about the three uh, divisions that you've made in your in your work about porn. Yeah. So, so I, I think we can we can think about porn in in sort of three camps, right? There's mainstream porn, which I've alluded to, which is probably what most of your listeners are thinking about when they think about porn, if they think about porn at all, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is to say, uh, you know, it's characterized by sort of misogynistic language, uh, women are denigrated, um, and there's y almost always a, a power imbalance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There is a, sort of a, uh, an agent who is experiencing pleasure and a, like a subject who is, who is like receiving the actions of mm -hmm. the agent, and, you know, it's almost always men who are the agents and women who are the subjects. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is not, uh, this is not by any, any stretch of the imagination, all-inclusive. I mean, this is to say nothing about, like, gay porn um, or, or, you know, like, porn that only has one performer in it. Uh, you know, but this is, this is just sort of a, a general theme. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also see this reflected in, like, language. If you just scroll through uh, most like two, what are referred to as tube sites, which mm -hmm. you know traffic in like uh, snippets and individual mm -hmm. clips, um, usually taken from longer media. If you scroll through the titles, 
it's you know it's always the most like the the most vile descriptions of women right mm -hmm. um, and use of extremely aggressive violent language, um, but almost never uh, is the target of the violence in the language uh, you know a man right it's always women so this is this is what we think of when we think of mainstream porn, and then we can think of porn that sort of um, flips this on its head right I, I refer to this as, as subversive porn. Mm -hmm. So this would be, um, you know, a lot of this shows up in, like, uh, kink porn, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have all the same power dynamics, but the the sex relationships are flipped, yeah. right? So women are uh, sort of in control in the situation. Men are somehow denigrated. You know, if there's an act of penetration, usually the recipient of penetration is uh, the man. Mm -hmm. And this sort of, you know, harkens back uh, the... The feminist philosopher Andrea Dworkin points out that under, you know, in a, in a patriarchal system, any penetrating act is inherently denigrating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and so subversive porn is subversive because it flips that, right? Mm -hmm. right. So this would be, you know, the classic uh, is is something like pegging, mm -hmm. uh, in which you know a, a woman is penetrating a man, mm -hmm. and you know the reason this strikes us as, uh, you know, visually powerful is because it is exactly the opposite of our expectations, mm -hmm. but the imp the implicit you know the imp the implicit uh, language there is that our expectations are in some way normal, and this is poignant and powerful because it flips our expectations. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not like it's not like this does anything to deconstruct our view of of power relationships in in right. a sexual context. Right? All right. it does is make us say, oh, isn't that interesting? It's mm. opposite, right? Mm. It's flipped. Mm. It's, it's exactly the thing I would expect, but in reverse. That still reinforces the idea that there's a normal way things can be, mm. and then maybe sometimes for some people it's fun to imagine the opposite, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't actually deconstruct anything. And that leaves room for what you know, I refer to as, as ideal porn, uh, which does exist, and I, I think could be more popular. Um, ideal porn is porn that takes great efforts to show healthy sexual behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that is notoriously lacking from a lot of porn content, and when porn gets truncated for these tube sites, this mm -hmm. is almost always the first thing that gets cut, are conversations about consent, mm -hmm. you know, right. descriptions of safe words, mm -hmm. uh, things that... that most sex educators will tell you are features of, of healthy sexual practices. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, the use of safe words is not, you know, most, most experts will, will tell you, like, it should not be limited to people who engage in, like, you know, kinky sex, mm -hmm. right? And sex that is, is more taboo. Mm -hmm. Like, there's totally a place for safe words in, like, ordinary vanilla sex. There's no sexual dynamic that couldn't benefit from the inclusion of safe words, mm -hmm. which makes it so strange that it's almost never featured in mm -hmm. porn. You also don't see, uh, you don't see uh, partners in a, in a porn scene who communicate throughout, right? Mm -hmm. I right. mean, sometimes, sometimes, like sometimes there's, there's a communication, but it's not, it's exchange of words. It's not actually meant to be communicative. Mm -hmm. um, another feature of ideal porn would be something like realistic depictions of pleasure, mm -hmm. specifically realistic depictions of female pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is, since at least the 1950s, we've known uh, that there is something called, well, loosely referred to as the orgasm gap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, last numbers I saw were something like two to one, right? In most heterosexual relationships, the number of orgasms uh, that the male partner has tend to be twice, twice. the number of orgasms that the female partner have. Uh, we've known about that for a long time, and it's not surprising because, like, when when do porn scenes end? Well, they usually end when when the man in the scene finishes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, when the man finishes, sex is done, and that is that is the implication there. Um, so ideal porn uh, features, and uh, and by the way, in mainstream porn, when we see you know a woman a woman's pleasure, it's always cartoonish and over the top. And extremely unrealistic, mm -hmm. which itself is uh, harmful because it sets you know bad standards for 
for the audiences, right? I mean, right. we know that young men start watching porn very, very early in, li in life, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier uh, 12, 13. Mm -hmm. That's entirely in line with, with what um, survey data says. Yep. Right? In, some, in some geographic regions, it's as young as 11. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is way before anyone's having a serious conversation about yeah. sexual health. Yep. And way, way before anyone's having a serious conversation about what sex looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you're watching main, you know, mainstream porn where uh, a, like female pleasure is depicted in a very specific kind of way and then you have sex for the first time in your real life and your female partners don't look that way and don't sound that way, mm -hmm. you're going you know, to think either you're doing something wrong or much, much more insidious, you're going to think that she's doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be great if you know porn featured depictions of pleasure that were realistic? Mm -hmm. And right. I think that would that that's another you know that's an, that's another characteristic of so-called ideal porn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, rightly said. Why I mentioned uh, my age was that I was fortunate enough to get that grooming that I that I understood this is not what's real. My my parents had like a major role in that. And then I sort of, you know, explored what it was. But you're right, most of, most of that demographic d will not get that grooming and they end up uh, thinking that this is what it is and that's how things are done. And that's, that's the wrong thing. That's, that's the wrong narrative. Yeah, uh, I mean, so I, for example, I grew, up in, uh, I grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania. I went to a school district that, you know, public school that at, at the time was regarded as being very, very progressive. Um, and you know had had very good academic success right turned out turned out very capable students and even still like we were abstinence only in our sex education mm -hmm. right uh, sex as a kind like yeah America for various historical reasons is a puritanical country right like I mean we ha are so uncomfortable talking about sex mm -hmm. especially with our families that is not the view of the West on you know, on the other side of the world. Let me tell you that this is uh, this is great news. I mean, this is not great news, but this <laughs> is surprising news. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, you know obviously uh, you know I, I like I have an internal view of Western culture, right? Like, so I can only talk about it from the mm -hmm. inside. But but I mean, sex positivity can can definitely come in a range. I I do think that there are um, that Western culture has a lot of sex positivity in it. I think America is uniquely behind the behind the bend. Um, in the uh, in my paper, I one of the people I spoke with um, was this woman. She's a, a, a sex educator. Uh, she runs a she runs a group called the Porn Conversation. Her name's Avril Louise Clark. Um, she's uh, well, she's actually an American, but she works for Erica Lust, who is a Swedish uh, erotic filmmaker. Mm -hmm. The company is the uh, Eric Lust production company is based in Spain now. I think continental Europe has a much more, sp you know, particularly, um, you know, Spain, Norway, Sweden. Um, they have there are definitely certain countries that have a more progressive view on sex and sex positivity. Mm -hmm. I think America is particularly behind the West. So if you if there's a view that, that, that Western culture is like sexually depraved, uh, um, I, you know, well, maybe, you know, do with that, that assessment what you will, but certainly by Western standards, America is more conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like, like I said, I, I grew up in a school district that was considered very progressive and we still had abstinence only education. No one was talking to me realistically about sex. Certainly no one was talking to me about uh, sex as. Uh, something more than just like a biological mm -hmm. function, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so sterile the way we talk about sex in the United States, if you talk about sex at all. Mm -hmm. We talk about sex the way we talk about, you know, hygiene, right? The way we talk about going to the bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's just a biological thing that humans do. Well, but it's, it's not just a biological mm -hmm. thing that humans do. It's, it's deeply oh, part yes. of our culture, and it has been part of our culture since the beginning, because of course it has, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, so in with this with this absence of good sex education and this sort of taboo attitude that families have towards discussing sex in the United States, and this isn't to say all families or all parts of the United States, but 
certainly that's that's the general trend. Uh, you know, who comes in to fill in the gaps? Well, whether whether people cop to it or not, we know that that they're watching porn at a young age, specifically uh, specifically like cisgender straight mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. um, are watching porn at a very young age. That's doing the informing. That mm -hmm. is their first interaction with sex. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the f professor of philosophy uh, at, at Oxford, Amya Srinivasan, she has a great book uh, called The Right to Sex, and it's it's a collection of essays. And um, one of one of them in there is uh, this this one's cited in the paper. Is she has an essay called Talking to My Students About Porn, mm -hmm. and she makes the great point, which is for most people. Well, for, uh, certainly for most men in the 21st century, their first sexual interaction is mediated through a screen, right? Right. We should be very cognizant of what that mediation looks like, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is the power that porn has for the whole next generation of men. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So keeping in mind the... the the three schools of thought, or not the three schools of thought, but the three divisions of porn yeah, sure. you offer your work. And um, also keep also emphasizing on keeping in mind the emphasis on the pedagogical prowess of porn. Mm -hmm. So if I understand your argument correctly, are you, are you saying that we, we should turn the porn industry into a sex ed industry? Is that, is that the idea? I would not go that far. Um, and the reason I wouldn't go that far is because... Uh, well, frankly, I think there's a, like there's just an intractability problem with that. Um, rather, what I think we should do is we should be we should take a, a hard look at the kind of influence that that the porn industry has and, the, and that pornographic content has, and ask our, if there are not realistic ways we can address that. Um, I mean, the what I think would be kind of a naive answer would be to say, well, just just ban porn, um, and certainly. People have tried. I mean, Louisiana, um, you know, one state over, right? Mm -hmm. Our neighbors in Louisiana have have in enacted uh, a fairly draconian law. You now have to provide your driver's license number to access adult content to oh. prove that you're over 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, which I think is probably well intentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really silly. Mm -hmm. I mean, every 12 year old with a, an internet connection knows how to set up a VPN, yeah. right? So you, uh, okay. okay, so you're just watching, okay, so you live in New Orleans and you're watching porn f in Austin, Texas, right? Mm -hmm. According to your ISP, right? And boom, you've gotten around the law. And then you can say, well, okay, so we need to just broaden the law, right? Rest restrict it. Well, uh, you know, let's talk about a country like China, mm -hmm. which has some of the most effective and um, restrictive internet censures mm -hmm. uh, of, any, of any country in the world, um, you know? They they have a porn industry. Mostly, it's it's you know they, they don't have a big uh, compared to other countries. They don't have a, a a big porn production industry. Although it's really hard to get numbers on these things because mm -hmm. it's mostly trafficked. Yep. Um, not online, mm -hmm. but like porn distribution is alive and well in China. Oh yes. Um, yeah. So if if the Chinese can't ban internet mm -hmm. porn or can't ban porn, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I I don't think Louisiana can. <laughs> right. I don't think I don't think. I, you know, I, not to mention, this is all before we even get into questions of like the First Amendment, right? Mm -hmm. um, there might be serious, for the federal government to try and restrict porn, there might be uh, serious legislative barriers to that and constitutional barriers to, to restricting porn. So banning porn um, or making it harder to access, probably not going to happen in, a, in an effective way. Mm. Right. So that means we need some other, other solution. I would love for uh, education standards in the country to be better, uh, mm -hmm. I think, across the board. Sex education should not just be, um, you know, like biological, like dry biological state of affairs. There should be discussions of, of um, you know, is sexual attraction normal, mm -hmm. right? What if, what if I'm, you know, like, you know, what if I'm queer? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what if, um, you know, like what does uh, what is what is sexually risky? Right. What does it look like if someone's trying to take advantage of me? Mm -hmm. um, you know, have serious conversations about consent in school. But we don't have a we don't have a federal, 
education standard for these things, right? Mm -hmm. We don't even have, most states don't even have state education standards. These are mostly school district by school district, not to mention you know, private schools tend mm -hmm. to be exempt from a lot of regulations on these things. A lot of people are homeschooled. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, like we, we've gone from one possible solution, which is banning it, to another possible solution, which is uh, Im improved education across the board. And I think we should push very hard for that. And I don't think we should give up on that fight. Mm -hmm. But we have to acknowledge that that's a long way off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's going to be a piecemeal process. It's not going to be a process that just is put into effect uh, you know, by the federal government and it goes into effect across the country overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's only, that's only to discuss the United States, right? That doesn't even talk about, you know, Canada, Mexico, uh, you know, England, wherever, right? Um, so this brings us to what I, what I describe in the paper. Um, I think we should just do everything we can to support the production of ideal porn, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these, a lot of these tubes. I mean, let's, let, let's you know put names to it. Like Pornhub is one of the biggest websites in the world, yeah. right? They yeah. get they get just an immense amount of traffic. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, Pornhub has an algorithm, right? Just like just like every content mediation website, uh, Pornhub has an algorithm, and their algorithm is trying to predict what will be popular. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But part of, you know, this is a thing that I think a lot of us have experienced. Uh, if, I don't know if you use TikTok, but like I think there's a lot of things that people have noticed happening to them in real time. The, the content moderation and the algorithm doesn't just predict what's popular. It shapes what's popular. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people are naturally organically really into sea shanties. Mm. Right. Yeah. We were all like like a year and a half ago. We were all singing sea shanties. Yeah. What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, because because the algorithm, d you know, predicted that would be popular and so it pushed sea shanties yeah. and yeah. it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. and we see this all over the place with, with mm -hmm. al you know algorithmic content moderation mm -hmm. um, well if the algorithms are just trying to predict what's going to be popular mm -hmm. and the only data it has to pull from is historically misogynistic uh, trends and I mean let's not forget long before there was a content algorithm the you know porn was just created by by studios and studios were run by studio heads who were mm -hmm. not necessarily egalitarian feminists mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and so you know the content being created the performers had very little say in and there was not a lot of interest in creating like so-called feminist porn um and so these algorithms are just trained on on bad history bad data mm -hmm. uh, so i think i think one possible solution for promoting ideal porn would just be to hard code into these algorithms, you know, uh, barriers on on promoting uh, violence, depictions of violence in porn, um, you know, algorithmically prioritized uh, porn that features discussions of consent, mm -hmm. algorithmically prioritized uh, porn that, you know, just fits into this this ideal porn category. And if someone wants specific content, you know, if someone has particular fetishes, whatever they'll find it, right? Like, it's not, it's not like I'm suggesting removing or hiding content. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying stop artificially promoting stuff that sets, you know, that sends a bad message. One difficulty here, though I think this is an avenue that's entirely actionable, one difficulty here is, uh, for various reasons, the porn industry doesn't like to acknowledge the fact that, uh, that people under 18 watch porn. Um, and you can't really blame them. I mean, if that was the, the, the work, you know, if you, if you do sex work, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's extremely uncomfortable. I don't know if you've, um, if you've ever like, you know, like it, I, 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 not that long ago, someone was flirting with me who was, uh, who was 20, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm 24. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a particularly big age gap and there's mm -hmm. nothing illegal about it and it just made me feel very uncomfortable right I okay. just was it just was scuzzy um, <laughs> imagine if you make sex videos and someone wants to talk to you about 14 year olds who mm -hmm. watch that of course you're not gonna want to talk about it it's mm -hmm. extremely uncomfortable and extremely mm -hmm. embarrassing in a lot mm -hmm. of ways mm -hmm. right um, but they are aware of it the, of course, they're aware of it, right? Yeah. I mean, you'd have to you'd have to be, you know, like willfully obtuse to mm -hmm. to not be aware of it. Exactly. But but if they're seen, you know, if they're seen taking steps, um, and this is mostly directed at 
at the production company. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, at the um, the the platforming companies, mm -hmm. right? Like the tube sites, like Pornhub. Because um, premium porn, you know, it's much easier to to vet your audience, right? Require mm -hmm. use of a credit card, for example. Mm -hmm. um, um, but like, you know, there there's there are basically no restrictions on who can access Pornhub, um, and the content is free. So, mm -hmm. right. so you know, they're they're and, and and similar tube sites, right? They don't want to be, you know, if if you say, hey, like you should be creating content that sets a better message for kids, mm -hmm. they are now in an awkward situation where, where to agree to that, they have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that they're not doing a great job of moderating access to their site mm -hmm. to keep kids off, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to take like a serious admission of culpability before they, you know, anyone can take steps to address the problem. Mm -hmm. And I see that as being an extremely uncomfortable process mm -hmm. for these hosting sites. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's why we, the general public, should, you know, normalize having this conversation and right. should come to demand these things, right? There are lots of other websites we demand ethical behavior from, right? Um, increasingly, there's an awareness of the effect moderation on Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. have, and, and you know, Reddit is now coming into, into public scrutiny as they gear up for an IPO. Mm -hmm. um, like we're aware that, that the, the editorial policies made by these enormous websites have big real world impacts. Mm -hmm. Right. It's time we start holding, uh, you know, like them accountable. Yeah, porn tube sites to the same standards. Mm -hmm. So with this, naturally leads to an hypothetical situation that, that I had in my mind, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. So well, please, by all means. Yeah. Um, so let's say, um, I mean, we're, we're keeping in mind uh, all the information that you just relayed about algorithms and everything. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm, uh, I'm a producer of a major adult entertainment industry. Yep. Emphasis on entertainment. Sure. And uh, I have an 18 year restriction before the website. I also have a disclaimer before the the video begins. Mm -hmm. How how am I supposed to be held accountable? That's one part of the question. And how, how, how will you convince me to change my mind as to why I should do this? Apart from the fact that I am aware of what's going on and what are, what are these tube sites doing? Because they're reeling. They're not, they're not uh, creators of this content. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, uh, it's a it's a big company. They just buy um, subscriptions, pirate those videos, and then just relay yeah. for free. Yeah. So the question is, I'm I would say that it's um, it's an entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I have a writer. I have an editor, mm -hmm. and I would like to create situations that have taboo relationships. Uh, student teacher mm -hmm. cheating all mm -hmm. of that um, I also want to have violence mm -hmm. and my argument is that hey if you can watch Game of Thrones with all of that mm -hmm. what's what's the problem here yeah um, I, I'm gonna push back on on the premise a little bit yeah. and the, yeah. the reason the reason for that is you know I've spoken to people who who are in in these production chairs and uh, are writers and uh, I've spoken to intimacy coordinators um, from some of these sets. And, I mean, that content is, is getting made, right? Uh, it's, yeah. it's historically been made. It's not going anywhere, right? But there are plenty of people who want to make different content, content that I think is, for various, you know, for various moral reasons, I think, better. Um, you know, it fits into my, my description of ideal porn. Uh, there are content creators and there are studios, um, you know, w one, one uh, that comes to mind, um, uh, recently on, on Netflix there was a documentary released called Money Shot. Um, it, it, it's a sort of highlighting the history of, of Pornhub. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a, a, they briefly feature, um, they briefly feature a, a, a creator named Bree Mills, um, who, uh, she doesn't actually, um, you know, she doesn't actually sit down with the interviewers, but but you know the production like pr uh, production of one of her scenes is shown in the documentary, oh, yeah. um, and I got a chance to speak with Bray, oh. 
and she you know was telling me all about the the desire to like normalize conversations of consent and normalize you know healthy relationships and and show use of safe words and talking about you know, there's no reason you can't have um, you know you can't have like kinks in your content right mm -hmm. but show the part where people say that that's what they're into right right um, you know show the part where people talk about each other's you know valuing each other right um, you know show the part that implies that there's safety on set um, <laughs> And, you know, th this desire is, is there, right, to create this better content. So the, the, the reason it has been, it has taken so long for it to become more popular is because there wasn't anyone on the back end trying to create it. Um, what we see, and this has been echoed to me by lots of representatives of the industry, as the way porn gets distributed changes mm -hmm. uh, with the development of new technologies, we see control of, of porn production become increasingly devolved into the the actors, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the you know in the seventies, it was all the big studios, right? The studios mm -hmm. could. I mean, the most famous, perhaps the most famous uh, pornographic film of all time uh, is a is a movie called Deep Throat. Um, mm -hmm. The year it came out, it was the seventh highest grossing movie uh, uh, at the box office. Not the seventh highest grossing pornographic film, mm -hmm. the seventh highest grossing movie. It was appearing on the same list as like The Godfather, right? Oh, okay. It was it was an extremely successful film. Um, to this day, uh, the woman in that film describes it as coerced, right? She says it wasn't even consensual. Oh. Um, that was oh, the 70s, right? Okay. Cut ahead to uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. Now we see the distribution is is mostly internet based. Mm -hmm. You don't need a huge production company that can manufacture VHS tapes anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Production is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more egalitarian. Mm -hmm. It's way you d if you don't like your production company, mm -hmm. if you don't like the way you're being treated, you have more options. Right. Cut ahead to maybe the last 15 years, right? Now you have lots of these mi like a lot of micro studios, mm -hmm. uh, and if if you don't like the way you're being treated there. You you leave. You start you start an OnlyFans page, right? Right. You you can distribute on your own. You mm -hmm. don't need to be beholden to a production company, uh, which has created a space in the market. As, as more control has been handed to the the actors and the creators, you now, you know, the the whole industry gets better, right? Because people who might be otherwise, um, you know, bad actors, they have less control, mm -hmm. right? They can't they can't coerce you into doing things because you have more options. Mm. Um, this is this is allowed for like ethical porn. Uh, you know, some people some people take issue with that term, um, but insofar as there can be ethically produced porn uh, and feminist porn um, and you know sex work positive porn, like this is all possible because it's harder to it's harder to control your performers. They have more more agency, more free will. Right. Um, so. I would push back on your on the, you know, the hypothetical and say, okay, you want to make you want to make this taboo content that that is uh, you know sort of fits in, into these unhealthy paradigms. Who are you going to get to make it, right? And I'm not saying you won't be able to make it. I mean, you'll make it, right? But now all the people who want to and there is a desire to create healthier porn is now something you have to compete with, right? Okay. And I'm just saying, let's level the playing field. Let's not have an algorithm that artificially boosts the content um, that you've created and let the, let the ideal porn compete. Because right? there are plenty of people who want to make that and there are plenty of people who want to watch that. Okay. And I think it's for everyone's benefit if more people are watching that. Mm -hmm. right? Right. And the people who just, for, for whom that just doesn't work as porn, you know, we're not getting rid of anything. Right? Mm -hmm. like the, 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 the old content still exists. Yeah. Um, but uh, so yeah, that's that's how I would respond to that sort of a that sort of a challenge. Okay. Mm. So you talked about that as long as people are there who watch these mainstream porn, uh, our society will never be able to treat women equally. As long as people are there who are watching 
horns that have women who act submissive, people won't be able to treat women equally. And I feel, I mean, I think there's a direct correlation between feminism and the choices that people make in choosing their porn categories. In, in other words, do you think that our world will ever be able to reach to a point where it adopts the idea of feminism completely without making this change in the whole porn industry? Conservatively, I'm going to say probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a little bit of a feedback loop here, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, I, I think as we adopt a sort of a more egalitarian view um, just in the world, right, as, and, and you know, not, not to say that progress is a, is a straight line, but, uh, you know, I, I do think the future, right, like I think the next generation will be uh, more feminist, and I think, um, you know, I hope that m my grandchildren's generation and my great-grandchildren's generation, I hope there's like a, a, a march towards gender equality. Um, and as that goes on, I think we will, you know, critically reevaluate and hopefully deconstruct a lot of our social practices, mm -hmm. right? We have, you know, we have a lot of, we engage in a lot of terrible norms, um, you know, like the pay gap mm -hmm. <laughs> between men and women, which exists across, across industries, um, you know, uh, hiring practices, uh, academic appointment practices, um, discrimination against, uh, you know, uh, on the basis of pregnancy, Though those are usually, you know, that's technically a legally protected class, but it's hard to it's hard to always pick out implicit biases, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I I think as we work to improve, you know, in in that in that dimension, what we will see is porn that reflects changing attitudes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I mean, it's so hard to overstate in like just how like deeply sexist we were not that long ago. Not to say not to say that that things are perfect. Far from it. You know, uh, me a cisgender man sitting here talking about you know how how, how much better things are for women. It's pretty rich. Um, so I recognize that that you know that I'm speaking from a, a place of privilege. But I mean, if you like look at look at the way women were treated in the 50s. It wasn't until the 70s. Uh, you're gonna have to quote me on this, maybe even the 80s, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. women in across the country in the U.S. could even open their own bank account mm -hmm. without being signed off by a man. I mean, it's insane how horrible things were very, very recently. Mm -hmm. um, that, to me, indicates that progress is being made. And I think that the, you know, that sort of progress will be reflected in our porn, right? Our mm -hmm. attitudes, toward, as our attitudes towards women become less accommodating of, um, you know, sort of uh, sexual or otherwise uh, subordination, right? As we become less accepting of, like, disparaging rhetoric towards women, I think we will also become less drawn toward to it in, in our pornographic content. Um, we just, you know, it just won't work as porn. Mm -hmm. um, but... At the same time, this is this is the this is the loop. This is the the looping cycle of mm -hmm. patriarchal realism, right? We see things in society, and we take that as evidence that things are the are normal, mm -hmm. and then we continue our practices, you know, with our our confidence that that our practices are normal, fully renewed mm -hmm. based on the evidence of the practices that we've already been engaging in. Right. So it's gonna be it's gonna be sort of a, a sort of a bi-directional. Challenge, right? We're gonna have to. We're going to have to improve the porn we make. We're gonna have to make porn that has a healthier depiction of the relationship mm -hmm. between men and women, and we're going to have to, you know, work to normalize feminist attitudes and egalitarian attitudes mm -hmm. in society at large. And hopefully, at some point, they'll, you know, meet in the middle, right? And again, this is not to say that that there will never ever be porn in the, you know, there will be a day when no porn uh, features sexual submission. But right. I think we have to break down the idea that it's normal for women to be submissive, mm -hmm. right? Like, we should not see a woman being submissive in porn and think to ourselves, right, that's a woman, she's being submissive, that's normal. We should right. see a woman being submissive in porn and think to ourselves, right, this is a scene where that performer wants to be submissive, submissive mm -hmm. right, for the right. purposes of this scene, right? Right. right. 
Yeah. You know, so. it should be equally normal for us to see a man or a woman being submissive in porn. Mm-hmm. So this change in narrative is fairly nuanced in that sense that you want to literally change your mindset about your entire viewing experience. You oh, want to absolutely. understand mm-hmm. what's Yeah, going absolutely. On. I mean, we need to and the problem is you know, we're not entirely conscious of our biases, right? Mm-hmm. We're not going to mm-hmm. we won't know when we've changed our biases. Exactly. Yeah. And we have to get comfortable with the fact that those of us who mean well probably have biases that we don't recognize. Mm-hmm and might never fully deconstruct them. Mm-hmm. The idea is not, is not for all of us to be perfect. The idea is for us to take strides. The next generation mm-hmm. is better. Mm-hmm. And then the generation after them is better and so forth. Mm-hmm. Right? We won't know when we've gotten it right. But mm-hmm. you know, that, that shouldn't get in the way of us trying to mm-hmm. get things better. Mm-hmm. Right. So keeping in mind your um, egalitarian approach towards feminism, what confuses me is that you talk about that feminism in this view is essentially just the equality of two sexes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time you say that feminist porn, which is uh, targeted towards women, Mm -hmm. And also towards men who enjoy that kind of porn is is, it's not the correct way to go about it. And in fact, you also quote that any attributions or anything attributing to feminism as an essential feature is a problem. So why is that? Shouldn't feminist porn be a good thing? Because I mean, in certain sense, it is a fix to solution, a porn which caters to both. Mm-hmm. And But on the other hand, you say that if we attribute feminism as an essential property of anything, mm-hmm. that's a problem. I mean, isn't feminism just promoting equality? Yeah, I, th- I think it is. Um, I want to be clear that I don't think subversive porn is inherently feminist porn, and I don't think feminist porn is inherently subversive porn. In fact, right. I think in a lot of ways, I. Ideal porn is characterized by being feminist in a lot of Mm -hmm. contexts. Uh, What I do want to point out is that there are, I mean, feminist porn is actually has actually become an industry term, right? There are people. It's like a term of art. Um, There are people who create, who you know, by their own account, create feminist porn. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, Feminist porn is not necessarily. Uh, you know, so so like let's let's delineate this from from subversive porn, which is one of the one of the three mm-hmm. groupings I, I create for for most of the porn landscape. Um, you know, subversive porn might be something like uh, you know like femdom porn, right? Right, where where you know like a man is restrained in some capacity and a woman mm-hmm. has total control in the situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That just because the the woman has the upper hand does not make it feminist porn. That's right. right? That's right. That's right. Um, Feminist porn is usually characterized by uh, being catered towards the female gaze, Mm -hmm. right? Um, If you think that subversive porn is catered to the female gaze, some, you know, somewhere in there you're implying that it would be your belief that uh, all people are attracted to seeing someone who looks like them being in situations of control, which is not necessarily the case, right? Mm -hmm. so there, there. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is feminist femdom porn, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'm also sure that there is feminist porn uh, in which um, the woman in the scene or a woman in the scene is submissive. Um, you know, there, there's nothing. The reason I say that it's basically impossible to essentialize something as being feminist. Mm-hmm. At least in the context of porn, what I'll say about that is, you know, what is the feminist essence, right? What what makes what what is the continuing feature from from you know this example of feminist porn to this example of feminist porn to the you know what is the through line that makes them all feminist? Uh, it doesn't seem like there's some essential feature that links them up. Mm-hmm. Instead, it seems like they have some sort of like a like a what philosophers like to refer to as like a family resemblance, right? Mm-hmm. Which is to say, it's not necessarily clear what characteristic they all have in common, 
right? Rather, there are a set of characteristics right. that they have some of, mm-hmm. right? right? But they, right. N- there's no single characteristic or single cluster of characteristics that they all have, mm-hmm. um, right? And it's sometimes nebulous. It's difficult. You know, lots of things follow family resemblance, right? What makes something a game, right? It's really hard to pin down mm-hmm. what a game is, Yeah, right? yeah. Um, you know, what's the, what's the difference between, uh, like, uh, you know, a couple of things and a heap of things, right? Like right, you know, right. some, these borderlines are very fuzzy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, feminism is one of these things that has a fuzzy borderline. And when we try to apply it to porn, it's mm-hmm. just not clear, uh, exactly what the strict through line mm-hmm. for feminist porn is, but having a feminist bend traditionally is associated with an egalitarian Mm -hmm. desire. And I think ideal porn does that more effectively Mm -hmm. than subversive porn, right? Subversive, there's nothing about subversive porn that implies feminism. Mm. Right. Does that sort of, I mean, does that I mean, basically just letting women have the same choices as men in a porn setting. Like, if a man is doing what he is into, there should be a way of showing that that even the woman who's involved in the act is solely because she wants to. That's right, yeah. And this is, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, realistic depictions of female pleasure. Why aren't women allowed to have real orgasms in (laughs) porn, right? Why do they all have to be, like, highly produced fictional whatever exaggerated uh, version right and, yeah. and <laughs> the answer is because you know because we are you know we've created an industry that prioritizes you know the the male gaze right mm-hmm. which i guess we've decided wants this over the top fictionalized version of the female orgasm uh you know there's there's something very unhealthy about that expectation mm-hmm. um uh, so yes, I think I think your point is exactly exactly right. Uh, you know, feminist feminist porn would just be porn that uh, values women as agents, mm-hmm. not as objects. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, Andy, while reading your work, you I think introduce your works by by saying that it's a reply to Gail Dines's video, which is which is also a TED Talk and a bunch of other videos. Uh, she has a couple of videos, and she has a, a spe- there's a specific paper she put out in 2017. She co-author she was the lead author on a paper in 2017 that I'm particularly interested in. But yeah, right. please go ahead. Yeah. So the question is that up until now, uh, I feel uh, your and your work, majority of your work agrees and you've agreed in the paper that I agree with these uh, these ideas of, you know, how porn shapes the young mindset. That's one. Uh, creates an illusion of what sexual experiences are in reality. It feeds on patriarchy um, and, you know, has no, uh, no has does not have an essence of equality whatsoever. So can you talk about where exactly does your opinion you know, the, the, where exactly is the conflict or where does it diverge from her opinion? Yeah, so I think she and I agree that porn has an undeniable pedagogical power. She thinks this is, in her own words, a public health crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that she she might be overstating the case. I think, I think, I think there is a public health crisis, right? Um, and I think it's, patriarchy, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's the public health crisis. I don't think porn and patriarchy are coextensive, mm-hmm. right? I don't think porn is strictly a facet of the patriarchy. Right. You know, something I want to I want to be clear about is is anti-porn attitudes usually come in one of two flavors. Um, mm-hmm. there is the what I'm going to refer to as the so-called right-wing and left-wing uh, critique of porn. Okay. And I'm kind of dismissive of the right-wing critique of porn because it generally is motivated by sex ne- negativity in opposition to um, sex treating sex work like real work, in opposition to treating sex um, as, as sort of a legitimate practice. And mm-hmm. it, if I, not, to be, not to be overly dismissive, but frankly, the right-wing critique of porn kind of boils down to it's icky and I don't like it. Mm-hmm. And right. I don't find that to be a compelling moral complaint. The much more interesting criticism is the criticism that says porn's bad because it's harmful mm-hmm. and it's harmful to these groups of people that mm-hmm. that are historically targets of, of you know, social ills. 
um, women being mm. the, the, the most obvious uh, candidate, right? Um, but there's also, a, you know, all my work is to say nothing of the history of, like, racism in porn mm. and, um, you know, like, queer phobia in porn. Like, there, porn has issues, historically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but focusing specifically, you know, Gail Dines is particularly focused on the, uh, the way porn features women and sub subordinates women and otherizes women. I mean, she's, she's from a tradition of anti-porn feminism, um, which is absolutely well-intentioned. I think the problem is she's identified porn as being essentially harmful. Right? Mm -hmm. she, thinks, she thinks porn must be destructive, must be uh, you know, misogynistic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's wrong. I, th I, think there's, I think the evidence to support that only shows, you know, she cites, she cites a number of studies that, that talk about uh, depictions of violence in porn, right? And she points out that the depictions of violence are overwhelmingly targeted against women mm -hmm. and that it's extremely ubiquitous. And the study that she cites, first of all, radically overstates the case. Um, okay. It's, it's, this is nothing, no critique here of, of uh, Professor Dines, but the study that she is citing has methodological issues. And I think the authors of that study are candid about it, right? They, they have a, an appropriate methodology section. Um, they're psych researchers. Dines, I think, unfairly represents it as being um, a much stronger conclusion than they, than they make. Mm -hmm. Um, more like, I think there are problems with, with their sampling and how they, how they, you know, generalized, but it's also, the, this is also to say nothing of the fact that the data they were using was strictly from VHS material, uh, oh, from okay. pri prior to 2005, oh. right? I see. Oh. Um, VHS, VHS 2005, Pornhub <laughs> existed in 2005. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And VHS was on its way out, and um, there—I mean, <laughs> there are various other methodological concerns. Um, that, to me, first of all, I think Gail Dines has overstated the case for depictions of violence against women. And then, second of all, she's doing what I have, you know, referred to as moral essentializing, where she said, "Okay, the conclusion to be drawn here is that porn is bad." Period. End of sentence. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's right. I think the conclusion to be drawn here is. Porn has been bad. Mm -hmm. Not porn has to be bad. I mean, I, I, I really do think that it's analogous. What she's doing is analogous to identifying, um, you know, movies that you don't like or movies that you think are harmful or, or dangerous and saying, well, okay, cinema is bad, mm -hmm. right? Because look at these destructive... There's nothing, there's nothing that requires movies to be like this, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if, if, if you only ever saw books that contained hate speech, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or let's say, let's, you know, make it more analogous to what she believes the state of affairs to be. Um, let's say a massive proportion of books in publication were hate speech. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unreasonable to become book shy, right? To mm -hmm. think that books are bad. But that's simply not the case, right? Mm -hmm. We just need better books, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think w the solution, you know, she wants to describe um, porn as a public health crisis. No, no, patriarchy is the public health crisis. And porn is a valuable pedagogical tool that we can use to fight that Counter public right. health mm -hmm. crisis. Yep. We can push back against the patriarchal norms that we've come to believe are normal with porn, right? Mm -hmm. And I think she's trying to, she's one, pick the wrong target, right? And two, she wants to give away a really valuable tool that we could use in fighting the same fight that she wants to fight. Which, is, which already exists and is established. That, That's right. Yeah. Right. And this is also, this is to say nothing of the intractability of mm -hmm. doing away with porn, right? It would be so much more effective to co-opt it for better purposes. But even if it were doable to do away with it, I think we'd be squandering a golden resource. Mm. I mean, all respect to Professor Dines. I mean, she, I, I agree with her about, yeah. about the powerful influence mm. porn has on young people. And I absolutely agree with her uh, that, that the, the way young people think about women and the impact of patriarchal norms 
on young people is extremely corrosive mm. to the you know the future of, of a healthy democracy. I just don't think porn is essentially to blame, right? Mm. I think I think bad porn is to blame, mm. and I think we've had a lot of bad porn, um, but I, I don't I, I I don't think that it needs to be that way. Right. So whenever we talk about uh, porn, we know that the target audience is usually men, and young men usually. And when we talk about the implications of porn, we also talk about how it influences young men. Now we've talked how it affects indirectly women, but we did not talk about how it directly affects women. Uh, Professor Dines in her work suggests that porn has started to groom women from a very young age and it has made women realize or you know think that their value is directly associated with their with their desirability quotient and she also goes on talking about her uh, the famous story that she usually shares where she says that uh, when she was talking to a rapist who raped his 10 year old stepdaughter she asked him that uh, how did he manage to groom her? And he said that the society did it for me. Do you think that is true to some extent, or is there anything you know correct in that way of thinking? Or ha- have we? So what I feel is that she said that you know, and she shows a lot of magazines where women are dressed in a certain way. I feel that claim is to some extent anti-feminism because if women are choosing to wear such clothes mm-hmm. or dress that way then we're then by saying that porn has groomed them and because they're dressing such way this is a bad thing even if it's their choice are we taking the choice power from them yeah i, I mean I, I think that's a great question um i this is not to deflect but I'm, I'm just going to be candid when I say that uh, I m- most certainly don't want to be in the business of, as a man, <laughs> uh, talking to a, uh, a feminist professor who has worked very hard for her position, uh, how to define feminism. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be the one say, you know, I don't <laughs> want to, right. So be very careful about that. But um, what I will say is that it it seems like an overstatement of the case to think that women to to draw a line between um, between what porn looks like today mm-hmm. and how women dress on magazine covers mm-hmm. right that is that that is most certainly not a straight line mm-hmm. rather i think they're both artifacts of a culture that like prizes female sexuality mm-hmm. right and prizes you know like like i mean i mean Economically, we, we value female sexuality. You know, notoriously, you know, sex work is, is referred to as the oldest profession. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, d- does like, the old adage that sex sells is absolutely true. Sex sells. You put um, you know, an attractive woman in, in like a more sexually vulnerable position on a magazine cover, you're going to sell more magazines. Yep. Um, we know that. Uh, they follow from the same base conditions. I don't think that they are, um, you know, like causally related. And I also think the idea that that women seeing porn and that uh, shaping the way you know they they go about their lives, well, that's just as susceptible to the sorts of improvements that I think the porn industry that I've described that the porn industry could have uh, for men, mm-hmm. right? Better porn would address exactly that concern as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as to the as to the uh, the case of does society groom people? Y- you know, um, on one hand, yeah, we we have a culture that that teaches uh, women to be submissive and subordinate, right, and 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 devalues their agency. On the other hand. I'm not sure I find it all that compelling when uh, a rapist uh, says that a child was groomed by society because let's not forget that, that in that 
anecdote, that's a child, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, exactly. children okay. are uh, all sorts, uh, susceptible to all sorts of uh, horrible input from, from adults in their life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not inclined to treat that anecdote as, as particular evidence of um, the impact that porn has on, you know, women. Right. I, see. I think that's. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Uh, I think the much more interesting question is is you know like what motivates, um, you know like w what sort of factors go into motivating rapists to be rapists. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I as to the question like again I don't see any reason to think that better porn mm -hmm. wouldn't either either have no effect or uh, a positive effect right. on this situation right. Mm -hmm. In a way that that banning porn wouldn't would not be better. Mm. No, I I totally agree. I mean, instead of, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's a ten year old, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, they've not seen the world yet. They don't know what's right and what's wrong. But the one who is committing to rape have seen the world. Yeah, that's right. Um, I you know I I don't think I. Yes, I think I think this is a, a clear case of of someone has done something horrible, but this does not this does not serve as a particularly. It's a very emotionally evocative, but it's not a particularly statistically compelling case, right? This doesn't mm. inform Against us. Porn. Yeah. Right. This doesn't inform us about a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just a horrible thing that happened, um, and and you know we should take great pains as a culture to like prevent things from like this from happening mm -hmm. and provide support for victims of you know horrible things like mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. but there's I, I i just don't see the how this i don't, just don't see the connection mm. as to how this indicates that the only solution or the only thing to take away from this is that we should do away with porn right that doesn't absolutely agree. i just don't see the the through line there yes true so um Coming back to changing the narrative and changing the mindset, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about one of you talked about a lot of solutions, but one of them was to uh, kind of switch the roles of mainstream porn and ideal porn. Now, uh, again, if what do you think if there's a let's say we introduce it as a category on a porn porn website, mm -hmm. what do you think? What do you think how 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 to brand it or how will people actually go to that? category and you know let the algorithm do its way in the end um i think the the the, the trick here is to to not brand it right not is brand to it. just is to just shuffle it into the mix right okay um okay. and the reason i say that is because we don't want to delineate this as something new or different right mm -hmm. what uh, we want is to okay. just is to just like you know, um, think about think about positive representations of minority mm -hmm. minority characters in media, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. When you want healthy representation, uh, one thing you or w when you want a representation, one thing you can do is you can you can um, put a character in something to say that you've diversified your cast, and then lean on every stereotype you can find, and you know, make it not that interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or another thing you can do is you just have diverse characters, mm -hmm. right? Right. They're not stereotypes. They're just indicative of what real people look like, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in some ways, in some ways, the the not overstating it, the not being, you know, the just the normalcy of it, is what makes it so effective at at uh, communication, right? Very well I said. think I think shuffle ideal porn into. Yep. It, just into the content that's out there should seem and organic exactly yeah. mm. and i think people will i you know i'm an optimist i think people will gravitate towards porn that uh, i think people will feel better about content in which the people involved feel better mm. <laughs> that that's true that's true so we've seen a lot of people like gail dines is one of them who's uh, actively fighting against porn We've uh, also seen people who are coming forward, trying to change the whole porn industry, ch trying to educate people about it. But 
uh, I've seen a trend that almost all of these people are women. And we hardly see men who are concerned that there is a problem or, you know, just acknowledging that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Do you think the reason behind that is because men actually don't want to change this narrative? I think there's there are definitely a portion of men who don't want to change the narrative. I think more frequently than that are men for whom this this is I mean this is really what privilege looks like is the ability to not even be aware that there's a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? That is like the 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 most frequent manifestation of privilege in a, in, right. a in a given culture. Like why aren't men addressing this issue? Mhm. Because there isn't an issue for men. I mean, mm-hmm. I, there, I think there is, mm-hmm. right? But it certainly doesn't feel like it from the inside, mm-hmm. right? Um, th- you know, men are not, in, 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 in the most obvious ways, men are not um, bearing the brunt of these, of these harms. And they make up the bulk of, they, you know, like, like a two-to-one ratio, they make up the bulk of the audience for porn. Um, you know, it's just so easy to, to not think about it mm-hmm. if, it's, if it's not harmful for you. Um, so that's one thing, right? M- men have the privilege to just be ignorant of there being a problem here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Even though you talked about in your research that there is a correlation between men who show violence against women and, are, um, and they're the same men who watch porn which depicts violence against women. So even though we know, we can see that it's, I mean, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's an irony because it's directly affecting them. Right. But again, it's affecting them in a way that, you know, they're not, at no point do they become the victim. Right, right. 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 Um, you know, it's so, if, for victims, it's very obvious that there's a problem. Mm-hmm. For people, for victimizers, it is not necessarily obvious that there's a problem, mm. right? In fact, if you recognize that as a problem, uh, to recognize it as a problem requires a bit of critical self-reflection, mm-hmm. right? And that is one of the most difficult things mm-hmm. for people, is, is critical self-reflection. Right. Especially when you're talking about um, a couple billion people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To all, as a, as, a, as a class, you know, look at themselves and look at the people around them, right? Um, so that's, that's one point, right? I think this is a manifestation of male privilege. I think another point is the conversation, as for the conversation being led by women, um, though I think men need to uh, wrestle with this problem and recognize that there's a problem mm-hmm. and step up to participate, it's a good thing they're not leading the conversation. Like I really, I, you right. know, mm-hmm. I, I, this is, this is like one of the best things men could do in this situation mm-hmm. is listen, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like take the concerns of women who are who are affected by this. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, spoiler alert: it's all women. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> t- take the concerns of women who are affected by this very seriously. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, at, I think I think listening is is the first step. So it's a good thing in in some sense that that men are uh, not steer are not trying to steer this conversation, but they've you know they're also not participating. They yes. need to, they need to be aware. Um, but they need to be, uh, uh, you know, followers, not leaders, in this right. on this on this issue. Right, right. And I think I do agree. But there's also a narrative that's set in the world that whenever a woman tries to raise her voice against porn, they're usually by men are treated as mostly not seriously. They're not treated seriously. And I feel that's because men have these, this preconceived notion that when people are, when women especially are talking about feminism and their rights and how something is affecting the society as a whole, and even though in clear words, women are usually talking about how it's, it's if affecting the society as a whole and not just to one gender, men usually have this notion that whenever uh, the conversation about feminism is taking place, it's usually the women who want to be superior to men and not working as equals. And that's why sometimes men don't pay attention to it or they immediately assume that this is something that they're trying to achieve 
so that they become superior to us. And I feel like you said that there should be fo- they should be followers because most of the times, whether we agree it or not, men listen to men more than they listen to women. So if they become, if not leaders, but even as if they become means of propagation, I think this issue will spread faster. Yeah, um, you know, it's an interesting point you said you, you said there about um, you know men listening to to men more than they listen to women. I think that's that's definitely true, and to very like devastatingly negative effect. I mean, look at <laughs> look at all the Andrew Tate fans. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, um, in response to your to your point about you know men being hesitant or even or even resistant. Uh, because they feel like they're like like this is a move by women to to so, somehow gain an upper hand. Uh, of course, they feel that way. Uh, anytime, anytime a system favors someone, right? Any any shift to restructure that system towards equality mm-hmm. feels like uh, feels unfair. If you've come to believe mm-hmm. that the world is fair, and that fairness includes you being on top. Uh, I think for a lot of people, they don't recognize that they're on top, right? Mm-hmm. They, yep. they, the society benefits or, or society works <clears throat> to support them in ways that they are, that they just believe society works for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when they see uh, women looking to deconstruct some of these norms, they think it's it's a move to to push men down when really it's just an effort to level the playing field. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think. I think what we need to show, I think, I think something that would be very helpful would be for men to show their solidarity. That doesn't mean, you know, men should be vocal, but not, um, uh, but not in the center of, you know, not, not in the mm-hmm. limelight for, mm-hmm. for these issues, right? M- men need to see other men getting involved and taking women on this issue and on other issues very seriously. Right. right? That does not mean men should be trying to, to control the narrative. In right. fact, quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I think uh, a, healthy, a healthy thing to model for a lot of men would be um, men, especially you know, I think more high profile men, should show their support for these women. Right? Mm-hmm. Show them, like, make it clear that they, what they're doing is listening. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And they're taking these, these concerns you know, seriously mm-hmm. right. and that they are ready to, to help. Right, mm-hmm. and helping might mean, you know, doing what you're told a little bit, right? And it mm-hmm. might mean it might mean not trying to talk over people, mm-hmm. right? You know, just just accept that the that there's a problem here, right? Um, and I think as as men who are maybe uh, hesitant to get involved see other men, men they respect, uh, engaging in that practice, it normalizes it for them to to follow suit. Mm. Right. All right. right. So um, moving again towards the s- solving of the problem, um, picking up from an earlier point in the conversation, uh, you mentioned that uh, platform platforms like OnlyFans uh, sort of claim to have uh, you know authentic media, and I'm sure with the onset of more such platforms, the situation is likely to agree. But one thing, there's one thing that I wanted to um, talk about was that, let's say there's a, there's a, there's a woman on, on OnlyFans. She basically knows what sells. And this is money that we're talking about. So how, how does someone on OnlyFans, you know, how does she fulfill that responsibility of channelizing the right things out into the society? When she clearly knows that, you know, what sells and I need money. Yeah, you know, I think it's, I think it's interesting that you you raise this point, but what we're seeing on OnlyFans is, which uh, you know, I'd like to I'd like to just preface by saying, strictly speaking, not a porn site, right? Strictly mm-hmm. speaking, OnlyFans mm-hmm. is a is a you know a la Patreon. It's a mm-hmm. you know a, it's a subscribers based yeah. content mm-hmm. site, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just so happens to be inundated yeah. with porn. Yeah. Um, of that content, I think what we're seeing is what um, 
one of, one of the people I spoke to in, in my research for this was um, uh, a, a semi-retired uh, pornographic performer named Stoya. Um, and uh, she, she described OnlyFans as becoming personality first. All right. There's so much porn content for free. Okay. Why would someone pay for it? This is like a real, this is like a yeah, question that yeah. we have to, mm -hmm. why would someone? Um, and one of the reasons is they like, they like the person they see in the porn, right? It's not an attractive, it's not, a, it's not an attraction thing. I mean, there are so many content creators. Y you could probably find quite a fair few who are your type. Right. Right. Um, you have to, you know, what delineates one performer from another at this point, at this level of market saturation, is you like them as a person, or at least at least the personality who they present mm -hmm. to their audience. You like that personality. That's the thing that delineates it. That's the thing that compels you to pay money on a subscription model for content that you probably for very similar content that you could probably get for free elsewhere. Um, and so what we're seeing is is the way you stand out is not is not by doing you know weirder or more niche content. It's not doing more extreme content. It's just having a personality that some audience resonates with. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, people are so diverse, and there are so many different kinds of people that you have a lot of options, right? You will find an audience, um, you know, and what we're seeing is a lot of content creators on OnlyFans. Uh, you know, it's it, again, it's it's something. There's something to be said about about making content that you choose to make, right? That you're not coerced by any, you know, and. Can we talk about issues of financial burden, right? Survival sex, survival porn, which is a real thing and a real problem. Yes, but we're, I mean, really to address these issues, we have to get into a much bigger conversation about like fair labor practices, mm -hmm. right. unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. social safety nets, mm -hmm. um, right? You know, lots of people do a lot, like pe people also, people also sell drugs to survive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if we want to, if we want to stop people from feeling economically coerced to do mm -hmm. things they wouldn't want to do, mm -hmm. um, we should we should support you know we should we should put better so social safety nets in place, right? Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, for the creators who want to be creating content for OnlyFans, right? Mm -hmm. They're creating the content that they want to make. Right. That's a huge improvement over the studio system of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I mean, right. radical improvement. Right. You put all the all the creative control into the into the performer. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's very well put. All right. So uh, towards the end of your work, uh, you talk about a bunch of solutions, and we've you know we've touched onto these solutions, starting with fixing the algorithm, organically flooding in porn, and um, and money and many other on on such grounds. Finally, my last question is um, twofold, and the the question is, how realistic do you think these solutions are? And the natural extension to that question is, I want you to give a, I want you to encapsulate that thought, the first part of the question, and give like a sharp solution in your opinion that that could actually work. So how realistic is it? Um, I I think the barrier here, the only the only real barrier, is uh, a social will, right? We've seen that these um, that that tech companies are very responsive to the demands of their users, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we do this? Well, we have to um, you know raise awareness of the stakes of the problem. One thing that gives me hope is that in the last couple of years, Pornhub has changed its ownership. And by the way, they they you know in terms of the the free content. They they run the show, right? If mm. if they change their model, other companies will be compelled to change their model to keep up, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they've recently been acquired uh, by. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's Ethical Capital Partners or Ethical Capital Group, something to that effect, um, which is happy to 
to make some changes, right? That I mean, that's sort of their shtick. So I think now, like, like the iron is hot. Now is the time to strike. This is a time that we can see actual change. Um, and if they if they don't keep up, they're gonna just lose, you know, lose support to OnlyFans and mm. to uh, individual content creators. Right. Um, so, in some sense, I think it's very realistic if we, you know, if we can be engaged on these issues. Um, I do think it's a little bit up to us. I think in time, this is the trend we're going to see. But I mm -hmm. think we can take steps to speed this along. Um, mm -hmm. I think we can speed it along much quicker if, if there's a, a social will to do so. Right. Uh, as for what those solutions look like, um, there's, you know, here's the pie in the sky answer. Here's the really insane idea. The really insane idea would be like subsidize it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, capital groups that want to give money to content creators that want to create ideal porn, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, you know, or, or, you know, if you can afford it, pay for your porn, right? Instead of, instead of uh, mm -hmm. watching, you know, supporting the tube sites, right? Put the pressure on for this change to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the more realistic thing is uh, we saw, we saw a couple of years ago, Pornhub was very receptive to uh, public demands that they remove pirated content. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, and the reason for this is because a lot of the pirated content was revenge porn. Mm -hmm. It was filmed or uploaded non-consensually, mm -hmm. right? Which is tantamount to rape. Mm -hmm. Right. They got so much negative backlash that they changed their model. The model became you must be a registered content creator. Mm -hmm. okay. You have to create an account. You have to link uh, link um, either either a bank account or a PayPal to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to provide them ID to get to get verified, mm -hmm. okay. um, to prove you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, you have to upload your, your con and then you upload your content, right? If they were receptive to that, I'd see no reason that they wouldn't be receptive to a sufficiently large public backlash demanding, uh, this become the expectation, right? That they change their algorithm to no longer artificially bump up, you know, Porn that features violent rhetoric, porn that is, mm -hmm. uh, that is, um, you know, misogynistic in mm -hmm. nature, right. or relying on the subversion of expectations of misogyny, right? I think the studios will will make it, right? I think the studios will make it more if they know they're not swimming against the tide, right? right. And I right. think the the algorithm is a thing. Like people make the algorithm. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. yeah. People can change the algorithm. They have absolutely. They have an enormous team of programmers. Mm. Oh yes, yeah. Right, they. This is a step they could. This is a concrete step that they could take, and they run the game if they change all their competition. First of all, not to, not to mention that that uh, the owners of por the, the the founders of Pornhub own uh, three of the five next biggest tube sites as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they change how they do things, the rest of the industry will follow. Will follow. And I. So I think that's that's the way forward. Is put the pressure on. Well, that's a hope that we all share, and we're as optimistic as you are. Thanks for doing this, Andy. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys.